Welcome to the spirit world, answering your questions on angels, demons, and how the spiritual and physical worlds interact. And now your hosts, Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. Well, hello there, and welcome to The Spirit World. I am Debbie Giorgiani with religious demonologist Adam Bly, and hopefully you, because we are live today on the feast day of St. Padre Pio, a beloved saint in our Catholic Church, and we're going to learn so much about him today. And with your calls, you will enhance the conversation. So I'm going to give you the number uh, right at the start of this episode, so you can start calling in about St. Padre Pio on his his feast day. Here is the number 877-757-9424. And we have Libby and we have Carol at the phones. Hi, you guys, you're doing great. And uh, phone lines are going to start to uh, light up because you love Padre Pio, right? We all love Padre Pio. And uh, Adam, we always begin with the St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father and of Son and of the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And this is the actual feast day of St. Padre Pio. He died in 1968, and Adam is going to give us a short, condensed bio on this great saint, and then we'll get into all the many mystical, supernatural gifts that he received from God himself. But we are live today, so we do have the show team in place. Carol and Libby are waiting to answer your calls. Um, We want to thank the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network for airing this program, The Spirit World. So call in and uh, share your experience of St. Padre Pio, your questions about this great saint, whatever you want to ask or comment on about this saint on his his feast day, do it now. 877-757-9424. If you don't want to go on air with us, we understand that, although we're, we're very friendly. So it's a nice experience. We think that's the feedback we're getting. You can always send us an email at TSW, that stands for the spirit world, at GRN, that stands for who produces this show, Guadalupe Radio Network, GRN Online. Dot com. Okay, and we have Tim, our supervising uh, producer in place, and Taylor, our main producer here on the Spirit World. The show team's in place now, Adam. We just wait for the calls to come in. But Adam, please start with this incredible background on this, uh, lo- this saint that we all know and love. Sure, Deb. Okay, so Padre Pia was born May 25th, 1887, in Petrolcine, Italy. So he was born to a very poor family, kind of in the country, uh, a a simple family. And he was given the name uh, when he was born of Francesco, which, you know, of course, uh, in God's providence, there's probably no coincidence in that, that that is also the name of St. Francis, who is the first uh, documented stigmatic, though, of course, we've talked about that on the show before. Paul may have been a stigmatic, uh, though we're not completely sure on that one. Okay, so he's born in 1887. He's born Francesco. He's named after St. Francis. At only 16 years old, Deb, isn't this amazing? Um, when we, you know, we think of today, at only 16, he enters the Capuchin Friars as a novitiate, uh, which is amazing. Then he takes his temporary vows almost immediately by January uh, a 22nd. So he goes in on January 6th. By January 22nd, he's already taking simple vows. Um, and then January 27th, just a few years later in 1907, he's about 20 years old. He takes perpetual vows. So can you imagine only being 20 years old and you're at a point where you're willing to take perpetual vows for the rest of your life to live uh, the religious life? And of course, we know the Franciscans are friars, which means they are religious that kind of live in the world. Their, Their charism is to interact with the world and the people. But still, at 20 years old, that's an amazing commitment. Well, just a few years later, at about 23 years old, on August 10th of 1910, he's ordained a priest. So here he is, he's 23 years old, he's ordained a priest, 
And then uh, he has um, basically really quickly, September of 1911, so about a year later, he receives the stigmata on his hands, which is kind of the, the visible wounds in his case. It was a visible stigmata that he was embarrassed by in terms of not wanting attention for himself. And as most people with the stigmata do, he prayed that it not be visible to others so that it wouldn't draw attention to him. But he he also accepted the pain of it, which is often um, what people pray for. Okay, so then he gets really sick and he had always kind of been physically ill. He was prone to illness, prone to chest problems, lung problems, that type of thing. And so they actually uh, send him home for a while. He's so sick to live with his family. And uh, during that time, he is drafted into the military briefly. And this is a little detail that, that you know, it's easy to miss. During his time in the military, which was about 1915 to 1918, he was drafted in November of 1915. He's a medic. He's not a soldier shooting at people. He's he's uh, ends up being a medic in there. And he remembers the pain of the stigmata that he had experienced and he's probably still experiencing some of it and he makes a prayer and he offered himself and his sufferings to contribute to ending world war one which was which was going on at the time and so uh he sees the war he sees the horror of the war he's moved to offer himself and offer his suffering to god um, to hopefully end the war now, this is in, in March 16th of 1918. They then release him because he's so sickly. He so, has so many medical issues. They basically let him go from the military pretty quickly. Um, but he had seen enough. God allowed him to see enough of the war that he was so moved to offer himself up for it. November of 1918, a few months later, World War I ends. And I'm not saying that Padre Pio ended World War I. I'm sure many people were praying for the end of that. You know, many people had made offerings and, and all of that. But it's just interesting to note that he had a taste of the pain of the wounds of Christ before he becomes a priest. God, through providence, puts him in the military, shows him the war up close and personal, and he offers himself for that. Go ahead. Dad. So a couple things. Um, let, let's let's talk about that for a moment, because he was as a medic in World War One. Um, they had the compound that they used in surgeries and injections and stuff like that, carbolic acid. And this carbolic acid ended up being something of a of a real a pain for um, Padre Pio because when he received the stigmata and then they st- and then they started investigating it uh, down the road, they they made the connection that oh possibly because he was in in the military and he was introduced to this carbolic acid. He probably wasn't doing this to himself to gain attention. And it was horrible what Padre Pio had to go through. So isn't it interesting, Adam, that here he went into um, the military. He offered himself as a victim soul. He, he, he offered himself to, you know, to take on all the sins and and to, to stop this war. And then this and then like it's like it's the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Right. And then this carbolic acid um, theory um, comes, uh, you know, boomeranging back to him and really, really causes him great persecution and pain. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll get to that sadness right here. So he comes back from the war. He goes back into uh, the monastery, the Franciscan monastery. And in 1919, so he's now functioning as a priest and p- hearing confessions, people are coming to his masses and people are seeing these wounds on his hands. Those are the ones that are that are visible to people. He's wearing gloves. He's trying to cover them and keep them hidden, but people are seeing them. Well, of course, he, he becomes really famous really quickly. People are drawn to the supernatural and people are flooding in. Even though he's in a remote place, people are making pilgrimages to come see him, to hear his mass. He becomes incredibly popular with confession. Uh, some reports he's in the confessional 12 to 18 hours a day outside of his normal duties of, you know, his prayer duties and his other duties. Um, he's just in the confessional for a tremendous amount of time. And I know, Deb, um, you have a lot of interesting points about why people were so drawn to him in terms of his mystical gifts. But OK, let's get the, the rest of the bio. Well, he gets really popular. Right. And the church tends to get a little concerned when a cult of personality springs up around a person. That's right. And it, and it starts kind of distracting from uh 
in the mind of some people, it distracts them from the centrality of the Mass and Jesus and his suffering and his sacrifice. And they start focusing on that person as if that person is the source of the miracles and as the source of, you know, basically a way to access God as opposed to through the church, the mystical body of Christ. And so people get disordered ideas. And so the church kind of started investigating him because, you know, word of stigmata spreads and people get really concerned. Is this faked? Is, you know, is this person got mental illness and they're just hurting themselves? You know, all these questions, but also it was distracting uh, for the average people. And so they segregated him. There was this, you know, long time of about 10 years where they ordered him by decree from Rome. And he he obeyed. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He was uh, the quote the people that were there when the decree was read to him is God's will be done. Mm -hmm. And so he immediately submitted to the will of the church and took it as God's will and submitted to it. But he couldn't say mass for the people. He had to say it privately. Of course, every priest has to say mass every day, Uh, but they, they, it's not necessarily with the people and he couldn't hear confessions and he wasn't supposed to keep his correspondence up with the hundreds and perhaps thousands of people that were writing to him. So they basically sequestered him for about 10 years And they concluded, as you said, you know, there's something wrong here. Uh, We don't think this is legit. That was the initial response from Rome is that we don't think the stigmata is legitimate. And so it was a really it was a really hard time. But that was a time where, again, in God's providence, God brings good out of anything. Ultimately, this was a time of prayer and reflection and probably a time of incredible deepening of his prayer life. And uh he came, he came out of that, um, I think, exhibiting even more of the holy gifts. Go ahead, Deb. Well, I completely agree with you. I mean, if you go back to how when he was five years old, he was talking to Jesus and Mary and his guardian angel on a regular basis, so much so that he he would say to his mom, doesn't everybody do this? And we, you know, people didn't. Uh, he did. And at five years old, he committed his life to, to Jesus. And at 10 years old, he decided he wanted to become a um, a priest, a, a friar, because he mainly because he loved the long beard and the habit. Okay. And, but, but still, I mean, for him to have that wisdom beyond his years and his connection to uh, Jesus and Mary and his guardian angel, of course, when he was in this seclusion and he was, he was separated from the community that he knew and loved. Um, of course, he was going to get deeper and deeper with God. Absolutely. You hear the music, um, Adam, let's hold it right there. We want your calls, please. This is on the feast day of St. Padre Pio, 877-757-9424. This is your show, The Spirit World. We are a live call-in show. We're talking about this great Saint, St. Padre Pio, on his feast day today. Please join us. Are you feeling lost in a sea of overwhelm? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Many people find themselves challenged with overwhelm. Too many things to take care of, too many people to please, too much work to do. And in spite of their best efforts, they continue to fall behind with this overwhelm coming in like a flood. But that's not the abundant life that Jesus wants you to live. That's why Stand Tall Today has experienced professional coaches that will assist you in dialing down that overwhelm. They'll help you get a grasp on where you are and create a plan that enables you to take bite-sized steps of action so you can live an abundant life. Why not take your first step right now? Go to StandTallToday.com and find a coach that is just right for you. Because life is simply too short to stay lost in a sea of overwhelm. This is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. It's common for atheists who object to belief in God because it can't be proven false by empirical observation. But this objection fails because the principle it assumes, called the verification principle, is self-refuting. It states, a belief is true or false if and only if it can be verified or falsified by sense experience. Like the statement, it's snowing outside. 
which can prove true or false by looking out the window. But this principle is problematic because the principle itself can't be proven true or false by sense experience. Where in the universe is the truth value of this belief to be found? Can we see it under a microscope? The absurdity of these questions reveal that the principle itself cannot be proven true or false by sense experience, and thus is self-refuting. For this reason, the objection fails. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. Okay, we'll get to your phones in just a moment. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit more about Padre Pio and his many spiritual gifts here on the Spirit World because it is his feast day. A couple things we want to uh, just uh, talk about here for a moment, Adam, is that our listeners are already commenting in and their blood pressure is at an all-time high because they're they're realizing, you know, what you said, Adam, and how we shared um, the history of Padre Pio and the church started to have to investigate and question why he was uh, he rose to popularity so quickly, and you know they didn't want everybody just going to San Giovanni Rotondo just to see him, you know, and they you know they they needed to investigate many things, and then his superiors, you know, told him he couldn't go out into in public ministry and stuff like that, and he obeyed. And, um, you know, just, I think it's because Adam, you know, all of our listeners that, that are listening, um, right now, um, you know, we're kind of sort of, you know, devotees of, of Padre Pio. We love him. He, he was an amazing, uh, person, a holy man of God with many spiritual gifts. And this makes us really upset that the that the the church and his superiors wouldn't be behind him and supporting him because i mean he was such a humble man and you know a lot of people that they show the pictures of him adam you can see my my blood pressure going sky high too um there's a lot of pictures of him you know being so angry and you know that that typical italian temper but what they don't realize is he was a very humble man a man of of great wisdom and compassion and he had a beautiful gentle sense of humor and he was just a wonderful person and to see him kind of persecuted like this really hurts our listeners i think we're seeing the uh we're seeing the comments come in pretty fast adam what do you say to that well okay and and that's why it's good to go over his bio because um it's easy to to not know some of this background if we if we just see you know the modern images and and prayers and and we miss those details so why why might the church be so cautious we we have to put it in context deb the church has had you know over a thousand years of experience uh dealing with trying to discern what is legitimate and what isn't legitimate and the church has seen through her history that there are both cases of mental illness and there are cases of people seeking attention and then there's false gifts from the devil and so there's real mystical phenomenon there is false mystical phenomenon from the devil, and then there's human kind of counterfeits of that, and the church knows that. And so she is very cautious about endorsing somebody publicly and essentially, in a way, it's not declaring them a saint while they're alive, right? right because right, we never, the church doesn't declare saints while somebody's alive, it's after they're, they're dead. But it's kind of a saying, it's putting that stamp of approval and, and from the church's perspective, well, what if it turns out that five years later it's revealed this was all a sham? And that could do tremendous harm yeah, to people true. and their devotion. And so the church is real cautious about this. And the other big thing is what I mentioned is that we as, you know, it's it's our nature. We get attracted to the individual person who seems to have these gifts and we start putting them on a pedestal. And the church is cautious about that because you start making them a little idol. In mm-hmm. a sense, you're saying, mm-hmm. OK, well, that priest with his with his stigmata is the source of the special gifts that I need. That's the person that can give me healing when it's actually God. Right. It's it's mm-hmm. Jesus. Uh, it's the father. It's the Holy Spirit moving through 
uh, people that he chooses and chooses to give these mystical gifts to. But we kind of, you know, we get lost in the excitement and we start focusing more on the gifts and the individual person. Okay. All right. So you're right. And I'll, okay, so now I'll calm down. Uh, my <laughs> blood pressure will settle a bit. But you, you know how I feel about this, Adam, because I, you know, I get very defensive over um, so many of these great saints that that are, you know, people are trying to make Hollywood movies about and distort their lives and, you know, mm. uh, pick them apart and try to say, oh, they weren't a saint, you know, they're not in heaven, you know, this type of thing. It just hurts. It hurts my heart and it hurts my sensibilities in the sense that, you know, Adam, you you get somebody like Padre Pio who, who is 81 years. All the man ever did was serve God. That's all he ever did. He he only had two hours of sleep a night. He barely ate. He was constantly sick and, and ill with so many things, but he never lost hope. He never gave up on the Lord. He's constantly stuck very close to Holy Mother Church. He told all of us to do that. And then you you, you see how he was just um, just the target for so many you know, and then, and then let's face it, Adam, just the human um, condition. There was a lot of jealousy, even in the, in, even in the monastery, there was a lot of jealousy about him. And it's so on, it's so sad that instead of, you know, um, supporting him and, and lifting him up in ways that he could have really used for his own emotional support, right? Um, Instead, they just kind of chipped away at at him. He had to get really tough, you know. He had to hold on, and and that's that. That's the beauty of this great saint. He really did. He 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 stuck it out all the way to the end. Right, right. And it's important that we move past those ten years and remember that wasn't the end of the story. He wasn't just suppressed for the rest of his life. And you know, footnote on that, Deb. A lot of other saints have been suppressed in this way and yeah, silenced or censored true. for a period of time. Faustina was censored for a period of time. Um, yeah, there's been a number of them. So the church has been really cautious about people that seem to have mystical gifts. But, okay, July 15th, 1933, he's basically released from this um, being kind of limited in his activities. He can say mass again in the church for the people. He can start hearing confessions again. And... The next big milestone in his life, again, a lot of us, you know, I think can miss this one. He was really big on physical healing, so not so much mystical physical healing, but medical, right? He, he like the church, says, use the medical. Don't just um, say, no, I don't want the cancer treatment, doc. I'm just going to pray. Okay, we're supposed to use both. And he was big on the medical. And in Mm -hmm. 1940, he started plans to open a a medical hospital. Now, of course, there was prayer and support of things, but it was for medical services. In 1956, the hospital is open. There's a major grant from the UN because, you know, perhaps some of his fame had led to some good connections and also God's providence. And so the hospital's opened. Uh, As far as I know, it's still operating today. It's beautiful, too. I was there. Go ahead. Yeah, wonderful. So then, you know, we have many, many years um, of him working in the world. So the hospital's opened. He's focused on that. He's got tons of spiritual children, you know, endless letters that are out there that he had written with, um, Mm -hmm. you know, spiritual counsel to people. And then in 1968 is when he passed on. He got very weak, September 21st, 1968. September 22nd, 1968, he has his last Mass, which as far as I know, the the clip on YouTube is from his last Mass because they made a point of recording it. And you can even watch the final blessing that he gave to the people Mm -hmm. at that last Mass, which is beautiful. Um, I I really, I was moved by that. Me too. Um, And then the next day he died. And that's why today, September 23rd, is his feast day. Now, of course, later in 1999, he was beatified, and that means that his cause had been put up for sainthood. They had investigated his life, and then the first miracle connected with asking him to pray to God for some, you know, medical problem. Mm -hmm. The first healing miracle had been found. Then he was canonized in 2002 on June 16th, so another miracle Mm -hmm. was found. By John Paul II. Yeah, by John Paul II. And so, um, of course, since then... uh, the miracles haven't stopped, and that's one of the reasons Padre Pio is so 
famous, I think, is that the miracles haven't stopped. And, you know, with other saints, of course, miracles continue after after they've passed, which is why relics have become so popular, because, you know, they tend to lead to miraculous events. Um, him appearing to people hasn't stopped. There's been many reports of people experiencing this this priest, you know, then they describe exactly him and then suddenly he's gone. Usually it's in response to prayer when somebody's seeking healing. There's one person that experienced receiving communion from him, even though he wasn't there, he had already died. Um, there's there's just been endless cases mm-hmm. of that. So Deb, I wanted I wanted you to take the reins then and, and share some of the sure. mystical gifts that okay. Padre Pio is so known for. Well, and that's the interesting thing about Padre Pio. You know, he didn't just have one or two or three uh, mystical supernatural gifts. He had many gifts. He had uh, the gift of healing, bilocation, prophecy, miracles, discernment of spirits, the ability to read hearts, the gift of tongues. Um, obviously, he's an incorrupt saint, right? Um, we know that. He um, levitated. Um, I mean, it went on and on. He constantly went into ecstasy, even as a small, uh, young, as a, as a child as a young man he went into ecstasy and and what do we know about these these gifts well these gifts are extraordinary okay that you know just to even think about having the gift of bilocation he never left san giovanni rotundo for 50 years although he was uh, spotted um all around the world and he would lower his head and and the good lord would take him to other places he could um read and speak in languages that he there's no way he knew these languages how did how did that happen well the, the it, it's the gifts from god you know and he he uh, thanks his guardian angels. Now, um, when you study angels, it's, it's often said that if somebody has a big mission in this world, they are given more than one angel to help them. And so, um, well, you just have to imagine with the thousands and thousands of letters that Padre Pio received on a monthly basis, and they have a lot of the letters, um, stacked right there in San Giovanni Rotundo. Um, he had to, um, he had to, you know, answer these letters in different languages, respond. He he credits his guardian angels for helping him translate and do all that. You hear the music. Let's hold it right there. When we come back, let's get to the phones, Adam, and more about the mystical gifts of St. Padre Pio on his feast day today. Please call us. Tell us your experience of Padre Pio and what you know about him, how much you love him. Now is the time to call in. Fill the phone lines, folks. 877-757-9424. That's the number to call or go quickly and send us an email, tsw at grnonline.com. Please reach out to us about Padre Pio today on his feast day. We'll be right back. Have you heard about life coaching? Hi, this is Coach Felicity with your Stand Tall Today Coaching Minute. Coaching is one of the things Jesus did with his disciples. Whenever they were stuck, overwhelmed, or even struggling a bit, Jesus asked questions that brought clarity and hope. He then used ongoing conversations that helps them to navigate the path and completely change their lives. Just like the disciples, we too can find ourselves feeling stuck, overwhelmed, and struggling a bit. Maybe you need help in your marriage or with a parenting issue. You're navigating a loss, you want to improve your health, or advance your career. At StandTallToday.com, our experienced coaches will help you to take another look at life, renew your hope, Get past those challenges and step into living abundantly. You can find out more about coaching and schedule a free introductory call by visiting us at StandTallToday.com. Listen, life is too short to stay stuck. Contact us at StandTallToday.com. This is a Messy Family Minute with Mike and Alicia Hernan. How do you keep God in your mind once you're done with prayer and daily mass? It's different for each of us, but one tool we've learned to use in our family is Christian music. Whether you're working around the house or driving the car, it's far more uplifting to listen to than the overplayed secular love songs, and God can speak to you through it. It's amazing how transformative good Christian music can be. Music can help us memorize scripture and remind us of the providence of God throughout the day. It can teach kids the Bible in a way that they love, and kids can make music their own. As they grow up, encourage your children to pick out Christian music that they personally can relate to. There's all different genres, from chant to country to contemporary. St. Paul exhorts us, 
Sing psalms, hymns, and inspired songs to God from your hearts. Music can help deepen your love for God and lift your spirit to Him throughout the day. Try it this season and see. To find more resources for your family, visit us at MessyFamilyMinute.org. The Spirit World continues with Debbie Giorgiani and Adam Bly. If you have a question for the show, call 877-757-9424 or email tsw at grnonline.com. All things Padre Pio today on his feast day. So we have so much to cover, so much to say about this great saint. We want to hear from you now. So please call in at 877 757-9424. That's 877-757-9424. You do not have to be Catholic to call in. If you've heard about Padre Pio, if you know him, you love him, you want to learn more about this great saint, now is the time to call in. Please dial in because Libby's waiting to answer your call. So is Carol. They are good to go. They got their headsets on. They're ready. 877-757-9424. Or again, send us an email at tsw at grnonline.com or like us on Facebook at the Spirit World Podcast. And we're going to get to Beth's comment on Facebook. See, I want I want our listeners to know, Adam, that we do read all the comments that come in on Facebook. So please like us there. We're trying to grow the family there. Um, and Beth had asked about uh, current day um, mystics that have the stigmata. And you're going to you're going to address that um, in, in a little bit later, Adam. So everybody's got to stay tuned in about that. Uh, But I wanted to get back to this great saint who had so many gifts. Um, It it goes on and on. He could talk to... the uh, the angels. He could talk to Jesus and Mary. Um, he had the gift of of, of um, healing. Um, he did start the hospital in San Giovanni Rotundo. Um, he never wanted to call it a hospital. He didn't want to call it a clinic. He didn't like that feeling. He wanted it to be very very state of the art, high tech. Uh, it even has a movie theater in the um, in the hospital, and it, it's a place for for healing for those that are suffering. He that's the compassionate side of Padre Pio. That's why people love him. That's why people follow him because he demonstrated he was such a great role model for all of us, Adam. And I just wanted to say that in these mystical gifts that he received, this is this is my thought and studying this great saint for many years. Um, first of all, he was the saint that I believe um has totally changed my spiritual life. Um, uh, Saint uh, Padre Pio, of course, of course, Saint Francis, Saint Anthony, uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux, um, uh, Padre Pio, though definitely, and um, and 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 Saint Faustina, uh, definitely, with the Divine Mercy messages. But um, I will tell you, Adam, that the reason why I think. This is just my humble opinion why I think the good Lord blessed him with so many mystical gifts is because, number one, he had the strength to endure it. This is a man that got up at 2.30 in the morning. He worked 19 hours a day, never complained. He ate about three to 400 calories of food a day. That's not even enough to sustain a small child, okay? And he was, he was a big grown man, right? Okay, so you have all this it working in his in his favor he stayed extremely close to god um and had the most unbelievable like it, reverence for the eucharist it was incredible he put his heart and soul into saying mass right i just believe that as he demonstrated the strength tell me what you think about this adam as he demonstrated the dedication the commitment the strength to constantly stay connected to God, even though he was getting hit every, pretty much every night by the demons, okay, and sometimes physically attacked by the demons, because he maintained that firm commitment, God continued to bless him with more and more gifts. Tell me, am I on the right track or not? I think so, Deb. You know, I, I want to just super quickly back up for people that don't know some of these terms that we've used. So when you said ecstasy earlier, what ecstasy means within a theological framework is not like a human ecstasy of pleasure, but ecstasy is the word used for a prayer 
where you enter into such uh, contact with God that the person becomes transfixed by God. They fall into God as an allegory, and they completely lose sense of the regular world around them. They don't respond to sound, to light, to movement. They are in kind of um, a foretaste of that beatific vision. And that's what a divine ecstasy is. And, and that's what, you know, St. Saint, Saint John of the Cross talks about at the unitive stage at the end of the spiritual life. But the thing that you're touching on, Deb, is really interesting because let's think about when did Padre Pio first start seeing his guardian angel and having these unusual spiritual experiences as a child. We often think about mysticism coming at the end of the spiritual journey after years or decades of, you know, prayer and uh, depriving yourself of things as a sacrifice and, you know, spiritual exercises, uh, the grace of so many sacraments. And we think of it like John of the Cross, where it comes at the end of the spiritual journey for those few that God wishes to give that to. But here's Padre Pio. He receives it at the very beginning of life. And so that's a clue that this is a this is a special gift you know god can do whatever he wants whenever he wants to do it and this is a different type of life this isn't the the person who goes into the religious life and works hard at it for 30 years and then gets a a, a foretaste of, of god or a foretaste of heaven in a few moments He's given it right away. And I think, Deb, he was given the strength right away to live out the mission that he was put here to do. And that mission included needing special uh, extra protection and awareness of the angelic, which probably led him to enter so early in life into the into the Capuchins uh, and then prepared him to weather the storms. He weathered the storms of the 10 years of being suppressed. He weathered the storms of um, almost the daily beatings that he received from the demonic, which, of course, just like the cure of ours, we need to remember that it's a limited thing that God allowed. And we know he lived, you know, to a ripe old age. He was getting up and walking around and doing his doing his duties. So it's not that God allowed him to be crippled by that, just allowed him to experience it. The opposite side of the coin of the angelic that he got to experience. So I'm just saying, Deb, there's a beautiful thing that's underneath what you just said, and that is God gives a particular grace of perseverance and strength. And that also is a grace and a gift from God. You know, we like to think about the stigmata or the levitation or the or the the you know uh, divine healings and say okay that's God moving, but God is also moving in the person that perseveres for those decades with so little and the body still keeps going. Um, that is also a grace, and so it was his yes that was his contribution. I think is our act of the will where we can say yes to God, but the strength to endure the task is given and the gifts to do the task are given. And I just wanted to point that out. It's, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. No, that was well said. And I loved how you gave the theological definition of a prayer ecstasy. And you're, you're spot on. This connection where he went into prayer, he didn't just say the prayers. He actually um, he actually had such a strong connection. And, and wouldn't you say, Adam, that the reason why the stigmata disappeared a couple days before he died because he was already entering into the other side. He was already entering. He didn't, he didn't have to have the stigmata any longer. Tell, what do you think about that? The three days, a uh, couple days before he died, this uh, stigmata disappeared. Yeah. And the history of, of people that have had the stigmata, there are some that are visible, some that are invisible, meaning there's no visible wound, but they experience just the pain of the wounds of Jesus. And there's people that it's visible. Now, in not all cases, but a lot of cases, if they're visible in life, they disappear shortly before death uh, and the body is completely unmarked uh, in death. And the, those that are invisible in a lot of cases, but not all, the wounds then appear at the point of death um, as kind of a, a visual confirmation of what the person had been experiencing. And so, you know, there's a lot of mystery here. Um, and, and as we said earlier, a lot of people that receive the stigmata pray that it be invisible because they don't want the attention mm -hmm. on themselves. You know, they will they will hide the right. wounds like Padre Pio did with his gloves. Well, some of the brother friars would say that, you know, before he died, he actually had a glow about him. It would it would come in and out. And so it was like, you know, the 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 kind of the the taste already of heaven. And and plus, let, let's not forget that even though his the wounds 
for Padre Pio, the stigmata, it, it bled continuously. It didn't have a smell like a blood smell. It had the odor of sanctity. It had the smell of roses. It had the smell of flowers, beautiful mm-hmm. scent. And that is very important as well. Also, too, um, uh, you know, it's interesting about the, the, with the stigmata, a lot of people, you know, recognize, obviously he wore gloves and, and, you know, it would be bleeding when he would be saying mass, he had to constantly be wiping, wiping it. And, you know, and it, and you, when you go to San Giovanni Rotundo, you'll see the altar cloths and stuff have blood stains all over it. Um, but the, the interesting thing about that, Adam, is that, um, you know, I think that people maybe, don't realize this, that he also had the shoulder wound. He had the shoulder wound when, you know, that would, when Jesus carried the cross, you know, the cross beam of, of the cross Mm -hmm. and that shoulder wound was more painful than the wounds in his hands and his feet and his head. They were, it was more painful so much so that when he would change his t-shirt on a regular basis, he would, he would wince in pain. It was so, it it hurt him and no one saw that wound. They never even, Mm -hmm. they never even uh, addressed that. So, um, Let's get to the comments and the phones because I'm trying to go fast, folks, because this is the point of the show where you start texting and sending in messages saying, come on, you guys, get to the phones, get to the phones. We need another hour of the spirit world. I know we're going as fast as we possibly can. So Dennis was up first and made a comment, didn't want to go on air with us, but wanted to share that in Bartow, Pennsylvania, that's where the shrine of of Padre Pio is. Um, Dennis said that his mom had a stroke and then they went to Bartow and she was blessed and lived another 16 years. Um, and so they, they have several relics of um, Padre Pio. And she was blessed by um, one of the gloves, I believe. Yes, uh, was blessed by one of the gloves, the bloody gloves with the stigmata um, during their trip. And, and she, was, she lived another 16 years. I will tell you, Dennis, I've heard this many times with people that have encountered the relics of Padre Pio. Adam, any quick comments on that? And, let's, and then we'll move to the phones. Sure. Um, I've been to the shrine also, and they have the glove, uh, if it's still the same as when I was there. They have the glove kind of protected in kind of a plexiglass frame, kind of like a picture frame, so that it can't, you know, end up being worn out over the years. But they will bring it around and sit with people and pray with them and allow them to touch the plexiglass without touching the actual glove. Um, And, yeah, they they have many reports of, of miracles there. Side note, Deb, I have a priest friend who was given... Uh, what he was told was a single hair, a single white hair from one of Padre Pio's gloves, but it wasn't mounted in a reliquary, and we weren't mm-hmm. sure whether it was real or not. Right. He trusted the person that gave it to him, but you, you can never be sure without documentation and a seal. And so, um, you know, with his permission, I borrowed it and took it just to test it at an exorcism, um, which is some, you know, we sometimes test things that we're not sure if they're legitimate relics. And that wouldn't, you know, that doesn't lead to moral certainty that it is a relic, but we do test them to see the reaction. And it was in a, it was in a cellophane bag and I gave it to a person before the session. They were still in the human state. You couldn't see the hair because, because imagine a sandwich bag and it's kind of, you know, shimmery uh they they didn't know what was in it they couldn't see it they immediately doubled over in the chair and said it feels like my my head is my brain is just on fire Mm. and i said do you know you know is this uh person place thing what is this connected with and he said something there's a person and i said is it a man or a woman he said it's a man i said is he older or younger he's older does he have facial hair or is he clean shaven he has a beard uh, what color clothes is he wearing? Is he wearing street clothes? No, he's wearing some kind of robe. Is it black? No, no, it's brown, and he has a white he has a white belt. Mm-hmm. Um, and then during the session when we would use that, the demons were screaming about Padre Pio. Mm-hmm. Um, so even a single wow. hair from from his glove, you know. Again, we're not sure that it's real, but it sure seemed to be real. Um, And relics, you know, both for that, for healings, for deliverance, um, going to that shrine is is a wonderful experience. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Adam, don't let me forget to cover uh, stigmata with current day mystics. Let's let's save time for that. Mm -hmm. We're going to move to the phones. We're going to go quickly, folks. You can try to jump in with a phone call at 877-757-9424. We've got some fascinating comments and calls lining up. This is going to be really Really great. So listen up, folks. Robbie is up first in um, Harrington, Kansas on Divine Mercy Radio. Hello, Robbie. Welcome to the spirit world. 
Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just had a comment, a couple of comments. Um, my aunt, my mother's sister, of course, my, my mother's side of the family is from Italy, a little town called San uh, Marcos in Lamas, and it's not very far from San Giovanni Rotondo. Um, my aunt received her first Holy Communion from St. Padre Pio uh, back in the 1930s. Wow. And so, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so it's kind of neat to remember the stories that she would tell us about um, her parents taking them to Mass there and being able to listen to him talk. And so we kind of have a, a firsthand connection with St. Padre Pio. Um, I saw his tomb in 1994 when I was in Italy. And then um, again, we, my brother and my oldest son in 2009 got to see him uh, when they exhumed his body. So that made our son the fourth generation to actually lay eyes on him, on his personal body. So I thought that was kind of neat and cool. Um, and then in 1994, while I was visiting some cousins in Rome, um, I was telling them about our youngest son who was uh, sick with a um, non-curable disease and that I was there on pilgrimage to pray for him. Um, and my cousin uh, Tommaso pulled out of his wallet a relic of St. Padre Pio, a piece of cloth. And so we still have that here in the middle of Kansas here today. So it's a pretty neat, a neat connection. My grandmother and mother and aunt had a huge devotion to him and um, that um, she shared that with, with us. So Nice, Robbie. Thank you for the comment. And for those of you that are thinking, oh, I, I need a relic of him in order to, you know, ask him to intercede for me for something, for a healing or looking for a miracle from God, don't feel like you're missing out because you don't have a relic. Relics are great. Um, but the presence of the saints, when we ask them to pray for us, you know, we, we're confident they're before God. Their presence is available to us as God wills it at any time. We don't need a relic in order to make that happen. They are nice and they do bring an additional intercession. They seem to cause a lot of miracles to happen, but miracles happen without relics. Remember, before he was declared a saint, people would just pray to him and say, please heal me, please heal my mom, please heal my dad. And there would be miraculous healings. There was, you know, no relics present in most of those cases. So mm -hmm. um, it's it's a wonderful thing. I'm glad your family had that gift. And, you know, that encouragement's now spread to so many other people. Yeah, you have a special uh, connection to Padre Pio. It's obvious with your family. You're, you're very blessed. I mean, so many of us um, prayed for many, many years to be spiritual sons and daughters of Padre Pio because he said he could do more work after he died. And he has. And he, he's a, he has been appearing in hospital rooms, um, you know, with people that really are suffering, especially from cancer. He tends to gravitate and help with people um, that are struggling with cancer. He has a he has a very um, it's very you can tell that he very much wants to be involved um, so Robbie God bless you thank you so much for sharing your story with us call us again okay thank you for letting me. Yeah, thank you bye-bye thank you thank you so much have a beautiful weekend okay Helena is up next in uh, Point Pleasant New Jersey on EWTN.com yes. hello Helena welcome to the spirit world yes hello I'm Helena Hello, welcome. Go right ahead. Tell yeah. us your story about Padre Pio. Okay, Padre Pio. Uh, my grandson was a, a macho. He's going to be 30 in December. And uh, he was a uh, baptized Methodist, or Baptist, I don't remember, in South Carolina, okay? But then uh, he lives with me, and then he wants to become a, a Catholic. Took him three years. He won't get nowhere. We're going to St. Peter Church, Brava, whatever happened now. When Father Pio came, uh, came to the uh, to the Point Pleasant, uh, to the brick uh, in a brick uh, church. Okay, he 
uh, with the glove. We were in the line, we lay, uh, we, uh, you know, we kneel and stuff. Then I ask him, I say, Father Pio, can you, can you uh, help us? He wants to become Catholic three years. He don't get nowhere. I don't remember that was, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday. Saturday, he got the first class. And then he become a Catholic like three and a half years ago, okay? And now he wants to become a priest. So I ask that Father Pio, uh, you know, help him. Wow. Yeah. That what, what, I'm sorry, Adam? Oh, no, that's just wonderful. And it reminds me of the stories um, that, you'll, that I've read about Padre Pio, you know, saying to Jesus, you know, save that person, you know, talking about people he had heard their confessions. You need right. to give them a conversion. You can do it. I, you're the only one that can do it. Right. Um, and I, yeah, so it's beautiful that he's um, basically facilitating that still. Oh yeah, uh, Helena. I love I loved your story because it is so typical of Padre Pio. When you ask Padre Pio to step into your family, and I can feel the Holy Spirit on this, so I just know this to be true. Um, he steps in, and then and then hearts are changed, minds are going in in another direction, discernment starts to happen in a very deep way, healing happens, all sorts of forward movement towards God happens. It is so obvious to me. I've seen it for many years since. Since, since about 2004, I've seen it. And that's a lot of years. That's almost 20 years. And I will say, God bless you and your family. I hope he continues to discern in a beautiful way. Um, wow. You know, to think that the priesthood, um, more vocations, Adam, and I know that's near and dear to your heart and the work that you do. So maybe share a little bit about that. Helena, thank you so much. God bless you. Have a okay. beautiful Yes. Have a beautiful, you, you beautiful are. weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Adam, maybe that's a good time for you to share about current day mystics, what, um, our Lord is asking them to do and about the, it, those that carry the stigmata. Um, why don't we touch on that before we go back to the phones? Sure. So the phenomenon hasn't changed down through the centuries. Um, there's one case of a woman, Rhoda Wise, who is up for sainthood. Her cause has been put forward, and, and I share her because people can go and watch uh, wonderful documentaries that EWTN has put together uh, on her. And by the way, Rhoda Wise was uh, likely a big part of Mother Angelica's uh, vocation to the religious life and then eventually forming EWTN because it was through Rhoda's intercession and prayer when Rhoda was alive, um, Mother met her, um, that Mother was cured of, of basically an untreatable medical condition. So Rhoda Wise, R-H-O-D-A-W-I-S-E, um, easy to find her. She's an interesting example of the stigmata. And, and by the way, the church doesn't really make judgments on whether a stigmata case is real or not. The church makes judgments on sainthood. And the secondary things, like the church doesn't make a formal statement of saying Padre Pio had the gift of, of reading hearts and minds, and so he knew people's sins and he could help them repent. The church doesn't make a formal statement on that, nor his stigmata uh, as a rule in the history of it. It, it did happen once in the, in the very earlier church, kind of in the Middle Ages, where a pope did that. But basically, the church doesn't judge based on those things, and she doesn't make statements on those things. But when they happen, once a person is canonized, then there's a certain sense of that's probably legitimate, and we can we can look at it more carefully. And the church does keep basically records of all these things down through the centuries. So there's a rich history of recording. What are the patterns? For instance, 80% of them have always been women. Only about 20% have been men. Uh, the men tend to experience the wounds all the time. The women tend to experience only Thursday through Friday uh, in, in the cycle of the kind of passion story of Thursday through Friday. So the church has seen this over the years. Um, Rhoda was interesting in the sense that she wasn't hiding it from the world. It seems that Jesus probably asked her to be open and let people see it. And so that was a very different type of case. Most of these cases are kind of hidden from the world um, and never really revealed to the world, which is fine. Um, and generally, they're given a particular grace that they are to pray for. And we know that's true with Padre Pio and with the modern mystics. God gives them marching orders. I want you to offer your suffering for this or that. Mm -hmm. And in each age, he brings about those graces that that age needs. Yeah. 
Okay, so much to say about this great saint. Not enough time to do it today, but uh, we we did our best. Peg, we're not going to get to you and the others, but Peg's daughter was born on September 23rd, this great feast day. So you're very blessed. You have him very close to your family, Peg. Okay, this is an exciting day today. Please learn more about this great saint. Don't go to those Hollywood movies, though. Go to uh, authentic sources like EWTN. Well, for Adam Bly, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. Until next Saturday, have a beautiful and blessed week. We'll see you real soon.